My name is Frank Moretti, and uh, I and my colleague uh, Michael Preston, to my left, are going to present to you the work we're doing with something called Project Rebirth. And to follow the rules that my professor, Gilbert Hyatt, God rest his soul, uh, set out for me when I was a graduate student here, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do before we do it so that you can keep track of what it is we're doing and whether or not we actually get to the end of what we planned. Um, I'm going to describe how CC and MTO became involved in the project. Uh, and then Michael is going to show a segment uh, of a trailer that was developed uh, to raise money to make a documentary film that is in many ways the point of departure for Project Rebirth, a film called Rebirth. Rebirth? Rebirth. Rebirth. And um, then um, the same Michael Preston will uh, do a demonstration of how we're using Project Rebirth uh, within the context of uh, two universities, Columbia and Georgetown, and uh, also the way we're working um, or intend to work or give you some glimpse of how we might work uh, with other people who are interested in educating people who respond to disasters in various ways. And um, then we are going to, if we get this far, we hope we do, we will give you a glimpse of our plan, uh, which we've already begun with, to construct what we call the Rebirth Center, which is a collaboration of Project Rebirth, Columbia, and Georgetown. Now, uh, this slide is probably perplexing to you, but um, it's meant to communicate that a, uh, one picture is worth 1,000 words. That's 1,000 words, okay? So if you ever wondered what 1,000 words look like as a picture, there it is. Now, we're gonna do some real pictures. Now, this, this man is, uh, this is President uh, John DeJoya. He's president of Georgetown University. And uh, we got involved uh, in Project Rebirth because of an invitation he extended to me to attend an all-day session where he invited the clergy, the Catholic clergy of India who managed all of the healthcare delivery in India for Catholic institutions to come to an all-day session uh, where we would discuss and try to understand how we might help in that process as university people working in the United States. And, um, and uh, at lunchtime, President DeJoya introduced me to two people. The first was one of the cardinals of India who uh, oversees all of the healthcare facilities. And, and by the way, the uh, Catholic ministry actually provides 22% of the healthcare effort in, uh, in India and only represents 1% of the population. I just think that's an interesting statistic. But this has nothing to do really with Project Rebirth except that work is in the spirit of Project Rebirth. But he also introduced me to someone who I thought would be here, Brian Rafferty at lunchtime, and he said, you really have to know what this guy's doing. He, he's working on something called Project Rebirth, but he can better describe it to you. Now, Brian was supposed to be here at this moment, and he was supposed to uh, pop up when I mentioned his name. But we do have uh, his collaborator, who is the executive director of Project Rebirth, Kathleen, Caitlin Olson, standing right here, and can help us answer any questions as we go forward. So he explained to me uh, in our conversation at lunch how um, he was working on the development with a filmmaker named Jim Whitaker of a documentary that involved 15 video captures using time-lapse techniques of the actual re-emergence of the city in the place where the World Trade Center centers uh, actually existed. So if you look on the left of this slide, you'll see each of those represents a camera angle that as we are sitting here is capturing every five minutes a single frame. So that we will have effectively more than a decade of time-lapse photography that uh, is capturing the re-emergence, the resilience, the rebirth of downtown New York. At the same time, collateral to that effort, he interviewed 
10, and then eventually just nine people every year for seven years, the last set of interviews having been done within the last more recent uh, period of time. And his challenge was to create a film that would really be about the rebirth and resiliency of individual people who face tragedy as a result of 9-11, and at the same time, the resilience and rebirth of the city. Uh, this is Jim Whitaker, the filmmaker. So at the end of our lunch conversation, um, we agreed that Jim Whitaker would come to Columbia and meet with a group of people from CCNMTL and uh, talk about, like, well, what are the educational and research possibilities that might be something that would sustain the interest and values of the film Rebirth after the documentary has its, its moment and wins the Academy Award and uh, becomes something that just becomes part of the archive of other films. And from the very beginning, to give Brian uh, his due, he imagined uh, that the film was a beginning of what would become a larger effort, and that larger effort is what we're going to try to describe to you today. And during the conversation that we had, which lasted three and a half hours with Jim Whitaker in my office with a half dozen other folks, he became the first filmmaker, and I would love to hear someone say that he's not the first filmmaker, just to make sure I have my facts straight, who released the archive of what he was working on before he had actually cut the film itself. So he gave us the entire interview archive to work with uh, in our educational environment and research environment to see what we could start to develop that would become, in effect, the long tail of this film that he was creating. And uh, we did that, and we put it all online within the context of different tools that we use, and we started to collaborate with faculty in order to, uh, in order to start to realize what was the promise of rebirth. Wrong way. This is just a slide to impress you. This is the design of the uh, repository and way in which the film would find its uh, way into different applications. And um, I can't even begin to describe this. I think this picture is actually worth probably about 30 or 40,000 words. But what I'm going to do now is pass the baton uh, to my colleague, uh, Michael Preston. And then I'm going to come back and talk a few minutes about the Rebirth Center that is emergent and uh, in the process of evolution and, and development. Uh, Michael. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, Frank mentioned that there are 14 cameras. The time-lapse footage was used as a way to indicate the passage of time and show different angles um, of this very important site. Um, very beautiful. If you actually sit back and watch some of the footage, uh, you can kind of enter this trance-like trans state as time goes by very quickly. Um, so that, that's a very significant part of this archive. We actually have a partner at Barnard, Kadambari Bakshi, who has been looking at this footage and thinking of projects she might engage her students in architecture and in sort of imaginings of the, uh, of the site. Um, the cameras are located in various places. This is actually an older map, but there, so there are actually more cameras than the, those you see here indicated by the green dots. Um, they've added a few since then, but they're these uh, very interesting old technology, 35 millimeter cameras taking a frame every five minutes um, from various angles. Um, and as the, as the construction has, <clears throat> has progressed, there have been uh, new cameras added to the site itself to get photos from within. Um, but more, more significantly and, and more relevant to what we're talking about today are the, 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 people who, the people who have participated in this project and have generously donated their time. Um, Jim interviewed these people annually, roughly around the anniversary of 9-11, um, and the, the, the interviews tend to last hours, um, two, three hours at a time, discussing all kinds of things from uh, what's happening in their lives and how they're feeling um, about the, uh, the passage of time. Um, the, uh, the final cut of the film actually only features five of these people, um, but as Frank mentioned, we have all of them. Um, I think the, the, the last estimate of footage was about 180 hours of interview footage, so it's really not a small amount of material. Um, you might draw some comparisons to other similar projects like these two, 
Um, you're probably familiar with the UP series, which is uh, a British television project beginning in the 60s and continuing today. Um, they found 14 subjects from various social classes uh, with the intention of filming them to depict what it was like to, uh, to, to live in these various situations. And, and they've interviewed them every year, or not, excuse me, not every year, every seven years. Um, and I think the, the next one is scheduled to be uh, in 2011 or 2012. Um, as by way of comparison, the Shoah Foundation, which Steven Spielberg began in the 90s, is an archival project to capture the interviews, to capture interviews with survivors and witnesses of the Holocaust. Um, and I think to date there are about 52,000 of these interviews in that archive. So the scale is, is just enormous. But so the, you could say that the, the rebirth archive sits somewhere between these two. It's recurring. It's a longitudinal study in, in a way. It's, we have these, these seven years captured, and then we have nine people. So it's, it's quite an interesting way to look. They, there's these, you can get to know a single subject very well by, by looking at them over time, or you can see what, what it was like the first year after the, uh, after the event, or what it was like five years after the event. So the, we've basically created our own version of this archive. We, we, in one of our web systems called Vital, which is a, which is a video analysis tool that we made here, um, we currently have as pretty much all of this footage posted for faculty and students to browse and to construct various representations uh, depending on the field that the, the course is in. Um, and what, when the students browse the archive, they have a series of, or ex, uh, depending on, on the exercise, they have, they have a number of tools at their disposal they can use to make their own selections from the archive to choose specific moments to write notes about them and save them, and then go back and reconstruct various representations as they like. So they might be um, looking closely at someone for progress over time, or they may be looking for patterns or commonalities among the various participants in the project. And so but to better explain this to you, I thought it would be useful to look at four more stories. And these are stories of Columbia faculty members that we're working with currently on this project. Um, from the left, uh, Catherine Shear, um, who's a professor in the School of Social Work um, and well known for her work on cl complicated grief. Um, to, her, to her right is George Bonanno, who teaches clinical psychology at Teachers College. Um, Robin Stern, to his right, who also teaches at Teachers College. And uh, she, she's, uh, she teaches in a range of fields. This particular course we'll talk about here today is a human emotions course related to technology. And then to the far right is Roxana Suswell, who teaches in the brand new oral history Masters, Masters of the Arts program, um, which is a somewhat different angle from these others. <clears throat> so I'll start with Kathy Shear, uh, specifically a course called Adult Psychopathology and Pathways to Wellness, um, which is really intended for clinical students. So they're looking at the narratives of these subjects <clears throat> with an interest in diagnosis. They're looking for, for for symptoms that they exhibit. And so her assignment was to, um, to summarize the subject's narrative and to look for indications of strength and how it was exemplified in their interview. And so what I'm going to show you now is this is, this is a clip from Vital, and here's a student's essay. I don't expect you to be able to read, read any of this. So what I'm going to do is, is hone in on one small segment here, and I'll, and I'll show you the clip that the student made herself in writing this essay in response to that question. And the in this clip is, is, is another subject named Brian, who's a construction worker in this project. And his brother, Michael, was a firefighter who was killed on 9-11. And as a result, Brian went to volunteer during the cleanup and then later became a construction worker and was involved in the building of the new PATH station and the, the Freedom Tower today. The, uh, but here we heard Brian talk um, about his sense of responsibility and obligation to his brother, and that's what drove him daily to go down to the site from where he lived in the Bronx to help in the cleanup. And it's a, it's a very moving moment where after many months they actually locate his, his brother and his brother's company um, based on the tools that they find. Um, and what the student, the student is asked to identify these moments as, as an ins he or she finds an incidence of strength um, and how this, this helps him cope. But she also is asked to reflect on how it makes her feel. And she writes, what you see is what you get with Brian. I did not feel sad when I watched the interview because he did not portray sadness. It was all grit and determination. Could more probing questions have elicited grief and sadness? 
Yes, but that was not the point of the video. The narrator was telling his story the way he wanted to tell it, and the key point for me was seeing how his deep sense of responsibility drove his behavior. So again, making a very important connection from this material. So the next uh, case I'd like to focus on is George Bonanno um, at Teachers College. Now this is a somewhat different focus. He's a, he's a clinical psychologist, but the, the focus is more research-like in that he's interested in how humans cope with significant loss and trauma with historical and empirical perspectives, cultural comparisons, um, social implications, those sorts of things. Um, for his assignment, he asked students to watch footage of Ling and Nick, who we saw in the earlier film, in years one and five. So there was a, some significant time passed between the two incidents. Um, and to discuss what they saw and what they thought were the long-term effects. So here's an essay that, where, where a student responded to this question. I'm gonna focus on this moment here about Nick, um, Nick the high school kid whose mother uh, worked for Cantor Fitzgerald. Um, he's talking about talking to a friend who also lost his mother and finding a common bond between them. So an, an important theme that I think Professor Bonanno emphasizes in his course is that there are many different pathways after a traumatic event. Um, and Nick is a particularly resilient character in this film, and he's finding some comfort in this case where he finds someone else in his life who has a, a similar feeling after um, a traumatic event. And the student writes, Nick finds comfort in explaining how he also did not cry when his mother died and how he also felt guilty about not crying. It is a common but erroneous belief that most people are bereaved after loss. In fact, the majority of people prove resilient to an event, to a traumatic event, that is. Certainly there are other instances in, in the archive, though, that provide um, different examples. The next course I'd like to talk about is Robin Stearns at Teachers College, Human Emotions in Digital Technology, which focuses on the rationale for studying human emotions, specifically intelligence and awareness, but also with this angle on, on digital technology and how um, technologies can help us learn and, and assess these, these factors. Um, and she asks her students to identify emotional themes that, that emerge from the archive um, and how the technology enhances their study. So in this case, um, the student is looking at Tanya, whom we met earlier. Um, so in this clip, Tanya focuses on the memory of Sergio, which uh, throughout the archive in the many years of, of interviews, she, that's a theme that she returns to quite a bit. Um, and interestingly, the student who wrote this particular essay um, was from, is from Iran. And through specific examples of t that Tanya talks about in the interviews, makes connections to her own life growing up in Tehran and um, seeing um, the emotional states of her various family members during um, attacks and, and, and political turmoil, um, and finds a lot in common with Tanya. And she writes, speaking of the technology and how it, it enhances her study of these emotions, she writes, Cam the camera is the communication tool between me and Tanya. I wonder how would I know her without having access to this footage. Without seeing their faces, tragedy will remain an abstract happening which cannot happen to us, and hence it will be easy for us to forget. I wish there were cameras all around the world and there were audience for these cameras. How close would we as humans be? Finally, I'm going to talk about Roxana Suswell, who's our oral historian. She actually also has training as a clinical psychologist, so she has sort of a double interest in this material. Now, her course on fieldwork and documentation is actually meant for the practice of oral history, so she's training these master students to become oral historians themselves. They're thinking about the, the practice of oral history methodology. Um, they're thinking about individual and group differences. So when the person that you're studying is not like you, what are the things you need to be sensitive to? Um, one of the subjects um, is, her name is Debbie, Debbie Almontazer, and she's um, a New Yorker, um, originally born in Yemen. Um, she, she had been in the news for, for other things, but um, this particular piece that I've selected here is about um, her, she talks about her decision to wear a hijab and what, what that has been like. And in this particular clip, she talks about what it was like after 9-11 to be dressed that way. So the student obviously has, has a lot of material to focus on in terms of this woman's, uh, what it's like to operate in society after 9-11. Um, 
what, and how she as a student of oral history might have to contend with uh, new understandings and, and new kinds of people that she may not be familiar with. Um, I wanted to say something more about how Roxana found this archive particularly meaningful for her course and then decided that it would be better for her to speak for herself. And unfortunately, she wasn't here today, um, couldn't be here today, rather. So what we did was we videotaped a short interview with her. So if you just bear with me, we'll, we'll have one more voice here um, talking about the importance of this project. And um, it, I just showed them the first year's interviews and I um, assigned one interview to each student. And they critiqued use, uh, the, the interview using Vital. And it was just very positive. The whole experience was positive for them. Then they went to Green Hope, uh, which was this treatment facility. And I went with them. And we, they, each of them interviewed a woman at Green Hope. I'm going to pause that for just a minute. Green Hope is an alternative to carcer incarceration program uh, for, for women offenders. And um, that, that material they then used to actually do class presentations. What came through time and time again was how Project Rebirth and just watching those interviews influenced them, not just in the first interview, but in the second interview mostly, uh, because of the timing of the syllabus. Um, because I think, if anything, it gave students a great sense of confidence. And it also really, um, there was a hu very humanistic element, which is really part of oral history. And I think it gave them the space to really use themselves in the interview, not in a very um, obtrusive way, but in a very um, kind of limited but connected way. And I think that's where the humaneness comes in. And you see it time and time again with Jim Mutika in the Project Rebirth uh, interviews. So Roxana just said very much more eloquently than I've been able to how, um, how meaningful the archive has been and how her students' exploration has really turned into something productive, not only as, as something that can be used for analysis and discussion in class, but something that actually gave them real, real skills and perspective when they went out into the field to interview these women. Um, she said she noticed a really dramatic difference between previous experiences like this and with this class having, having worked on the archive together. Um, so that, that concludes my part of this presentation, showing you a few examples of how faculty here are using this archive in different ways. Um, I, maybe we can pause now, as Frank mentioned, um, to invite some questions if you have any um, or comments on this project. Um, we're eager to, to continue working with new people who are interested in partnering with, with us on this um, or any kind of uh, similar work. Well, uh, we're going to move on to uh, talking about what we see going forward. Uh, we don't have exact details of when the actual uh, documentary will be publicly aired, uh, but uh, we are assuming it's in the next uh, six months and hopefully it'll have some longevity. But uh, what we're already planning and deeply interested in is what human value can we derive uh, going forward where the, uh, the effort shifts from uh, the construction of the documentary to a greater focus on things that are much more like the prototypes that Michael's demonstrated. And uh, I wanted to uh, confirm what Michael said about the, uh, the power of the, uh, of the material itself. I've watched uh, maybe not all of the footage, but I've watched a lot of the footage. And it grabs me every time I listen to Tanya uh, talk about the telephone or listen to Nick talk about the bird, but there are really dozens of hours of very compelling testimony that will act as a powerful resource for educators in this university, Georgetown, and ultimately others who, who become our partners. Um, the, um, went the wrong way, okay. So we see the center as basically inspired by these stories, not just a, an effort to continue these stories, but to inspire an endeavor uh, that is truly educational to, uh, in a sense, extend the possibilities for how we can develop uh, ways of addressing people in distress. And I'm going to go through this uh, pretty quickly, if I can figure out which way to turn the cursor. Uh, our partnership uh, for the Rebirth Center is really a partnership of, at this point, three entities. One is a nonprofit corporation that Caitlin is the executive director of, called Project Rebirth, which has been the home for the documentary. And uh, the commitment of it as a nonprofit center 
is that all of the revenues from the documentary will ultimately be invested in creating the Rebirth Center. So this actually doesn't have a commercial side, just by virtue of the nature of, of the Rebirth Corporation. And the other two uh, partners are uh, Candles, uh, the Center for New Designs and Learning and Scholarship at Georgetown University, which is very much like CCNMTL, not Cinnamon Tully, at Columbia. And uh, we, uh, we're very compatible organizations that really basically work to say, uh, serve the, the faculty. And uh, the Rebirth Center will effectively, hopefully be birthed out of that set of relationships and already is in process of uh, doing so. Uh, we have two tactics, basically. We're building collaborations, and this is just a quick representation of some of the conversations that we've already had, and in some cases, projects that are already emergent, and there are others. Uh, right now, if you look at the Arlington Fire Department, which were the people who responded to the Pentagon uh, disaster, um, we're working with them to develop a, uh, an educational program for firemen that help them deal with their own emotional distress, not only in response to disasters of that magnitude, but in the general process of their engagement in constant series of tragedies that really characterize the lives of many people who are in public service. Uh, we also have others mentioned here, including our New York City Police Department and the uh, North Shore Child and Family Guidance Center, and we, we have other partnerships that are in the process of development. Our second tactic is that uh, we're not going to be focusing on bricks and mortar. We uh, talk frequently about universities that are emergent in the third world, skipping over the bricks and mortar stage and becoming virtual enterprises. Well, a lot of what we're going to do will have to do with, uh, in a sense, extending the power of digital technologies to provide services for people, educational opportunities for people, and tools of engagement that I'll describe very briefly uh, very soon. And uh, as is represented here, uh, uh, Michael demonstrated some of the educational uses which the top image represents. The second represents our effort to reach out to the community-based groups. And the third uh, represents uh, a more dynamic use of social media and network technologies, both as tools of response, but also tools that will help people connect to one another who may have had shared experiences or perhaps can provide services to one another within a social media context. Uh, we talked about the educational initiative. The only thing that this adds is that we have very active partners on the Georgetown side. Uh, Randy Bass is one. Bernie Cook is another. If you're interested, we have a university seminar coming up November 15th when Randy Bass will be here at Columbia talking about the work he did with the Rebirth Archive uh, in a freshman English course uh, at Georgetown. Um, and at Georgetown, they're not ashamed to say that they're actually interested in the development of human beings in addition to teaching them writing skills. And uh, so one of, I think, the things that distinguishes Randy's work is that he really talks about the whole person in a kind of old-fashioned way that warms my heart in any case. Um, the, if I can just get this going in a proper direction. The second uh, represents our uh, efforts within the uh, community of community-based organizations and public service entities uh, where we already have a number of projects that are in process. Uh, we thought it would extend the presentation uh, too long if, in fact, we tried to show you some of these. But this will be a very significant element of the Rebirth uh, Center's efforts. Whether we're working with first responders or we're working with community-based organizations who deal with people who are traumatized by ranges of different experiences they've had, not necessarily oral experiences that are related to disaster, sometimes just the sheer disaster of our society and the things that it imposes on people, but this is our, our second audience. And our third uh, really is a, a very different kind of enterprise that has to do with the aggregation and provision of a range of tools that are newly emergent that make full use of the power of the internet and, and uh, web-based technologies uh, 
to help people respond more effectively to disasters. Probably the most uh, uh, universally known of these is Yushahidi, which is uh, Swahili for witness, which has been used in uh, myriad different disasters around the world, most recently in Haiti. Uh, FEMA and the United States Marines said that without you, Shahidi, they couldn't have helped the number of people that they helped. And basically what it does is it aggregates messages that are coming from cell phones or other handheld devices all over Haiti into a website that then situates those messages in a geo-referenced context that allows uh, people who are on the ground to have some kind of orientation and direction in their efforts to help other people. And lastly, um, really, uh, in a sense, a corollary of the prior uh, resource for telling stories, meaning that uh, a way in which we can help people, in a sense, uh, represent what it is that happened to them uh, in the spirit of uh, the notion uh, that if we only understood what people go through and could only connect to each other uh, in ways that uh, allow for, in a sense, the empathic civilization that our, one of our colleagues has written about recently to arise in its fullness, um, we would have a better world as a result. And uh, so the Rebirth Center is going to be this, this uh, really multi-pronged digital enterprise that will have uh, real-life extensions uh, and will have a, a, a range of different deployments not only of the original archive of video that Jim shot as a foundation for his documentary, although we will use that uh, aggressively, particularly in our initial stages, but stretching out and beginning to incorporate in the spirit of the documentary a range of other tools and technologies that uh, hopefully will make some kind of a small difference in a very troubled universe. And uh, that's the end of our presentation. And what I'd like to do is just open it up for any questions, recommendations. And remember, all of our presentations today are invitations for you to be involved in some way with what we're doing. And we'd be delighted to uh, talk with you uh, now or later. Uh, you know where to find us, as the old expression goes. And uh, we'll, we'll stop at this point. So Michael and I are here to answer any questions that you might have.